looking forward to have now with me Bruce Chatterley from Zenit. And Bruce, he will give us an introduction about utility, utility infrastructure modernization and service optimization. Now we think uh, utility, but we are talking all the time about smart city. But I'm pretty sure we have a strong interlinkage between smart cities and utilities. Many, many cities run their networks by municipal utilities. Looking forward and get curious what Bruce will show us. Well, welcome, Bruce, to your stage. Good morning. How you doing? Awake after that last one? That was interesting. Um, so I'm Bruce Chatterley. I'm CEO of Senate. Um, we are a, um, did I do it right? Hey. Um, we are a developer of cloud-based software and services and for uh, the rapid deployment of IoT networks where they're needed, when they're needed, and at the right cost. And the way I think about our company is we find partners that are trying to solve really big problems with LP WAN, and in particular with LoRaWAN, and we collaborate on helping to connect the solutions to those problems with the network that's required to help uh, solve that problem. Again, at the right cost, with the right characteristics, and and um, at, at the right time. Um, in terms of, uh, I'm just going to do a quick overview of Senate and then we'll get right into the utility stuff. So, so we're a company that uh, is scaling um, along with the industry, so we have lots of devices, um, billions of transactions processed in our cloud-based platform uh, on an annual basis. We have thousands of gateways um, and we're, we're getting really good traction in five key verticals. Uh, water utilities, gas utilities, uh, asset tracking, food services, and smart buildings and smart cities, but in particular on smart buildings. So, and by the way, I have a very little bit of time and a very lot of, uh, of uh, content, so I'm going to go really fast. So, in terms of uh, utilities, we, uh, you know, we think of utilities in three segments. You've got water, uh, you've got natural gas, and you've got electric utilities. Um, in terms of the anchor applications for LP WAN, they've traditionally been characterized as AMI. And in, in, in electric and uh, combined electric gas utilities, um, in about 2009 timeframe, um, those utilities began to, de to deploy AMI. And if you don't know what AMI is, it's connecting a, a meter over the air to read the meter. Uh, and produce bills and among other things. So electric and, and combined electric gas utilities have been traditionally ahead of gas only and, um, and uh, water utilities, although gas only and water are starting to accelerate uh, in the last few years. And we've been a recipient uh, with, with a couple partners in, in that area of that volume. It's, it's also important as you look at these industries to recognize the difference in the composition of these industries, especially if you're selling into these industries uh, solutions. Um, and, and what I mean by that is, in, in the case of water utilities, according to the EPA, there are about 148,000 um, public water utilities in the US alone. So highly fragmented, characterized by small utilities that have very little resource and you know, are, are trying to just uh, deliver good service to their customers. Contrast that with gas and electric, and I'll give you an example. In gas, and I have my notes here because if, if I don't uh, have the statistics, I'll make them up. So uh, this, this keeps me honest. Um, in, in the United States, only eight utilities for gas were responsible for around 33% uh, of the residential and commercial gas deliveries. Uh, a total of 26 or two-thirds of the uh, utilities um, supplied, uh, is supplied by an additional 1,200 utilities. So highly concentrated at the top. In terms of electric, um, there are 3,000 electric utilities across the United States. 7% of those are investor-owned utilities. Um, those 7% are responsible for serving 72% of all of the homes and businesses in America. So again, highly concentrated. So if you're, if you're looking at the water utility, you've got to figure out how to talk to lots of different uh, smaller resource constrained uh, organizations. And if you're trying to sell in gas, gas, gas uh, electric uh, or electric uh, standalone, you've got to figure out how to sell the really huge behemoth enterprises. 
So when you're thinking about LP WAN, uh, I always I always think about the um, the the standard. Uh, what are the benefits of of uh, LoRa WAN chart? And when you think about this, you guys have probably all seen this chart or a version of it. Um, but not all these things apply uh, in terms of priority to these segments that I just talked about. And if you look at the ones in green, as we've talked to utilities over the last number of years, um, we found that uh, you have to start with battery life. So, so for LoRaWAN and LPWAN in general, you've got to start with applications that require battery, which is why water and gas are really interesting because you can't have powered devices around either of those things, right? So you start with battery and long battery life because as you're scaling these applications to hundreds of thousands or millions of individual locations, you don't want to be going out replacing batteries all the time. So long battery life, battery powered. And then you go to things like security, which are critically important to uh, utilities in America, and then bi-directional communication, because if you want to deliver an application to a battery powered device that requires you to shut something off, like a gas meter when there's a leak, or a water meter when a customer doesn't pay their bill, or uh, when there's a leak, then you need a bi-directional capability. In terms of the second, second tier, uh, we've kind of put those in yellow. I won't go through them individually. And then the third tier would be things like uh, location and nomadic services. I, I put location services in the third tier, but what we find is oftentimes our partners will have a warehouse full of meters, for example. And when we do a propagation study that, uh, that we agree to an SLA around where we build a network and we say we guarantee coverages of these locations, oftentimes they think they sent a meter to one of those locations and they actually sent it to a different location that wasn't uh, contemplated in the network study. So while I say as asset tracking is, is kind of the third tier, when you're trying to figure out did you place a permanent asset where it was supposed to be, that's pretty important. So complex industry, you've got to recognize the, uh, the individual characteristics of each industry. Um, and then you've got to figure out how to position the benefits of LoRaWAN to kind of start narrowing down the problems you want to solve within these industries. And then the question is, what do you need, what's the tool set you need in order to solve these problems? And uh, from a Senate standpoint, you know, and, and, and many of my comments will be from the perspective of a network operator or a network platform operator that's partnering with people delivering solutions. So I'll have a little bit of a connectivity bent to this. Um, and one of the approaches that we found uh, successful in, in this space in general is what I call extreme flexibility. And so we've tried to build into our platform um, a, a flexibility that allows us to meet almost any need of, of a utility. And, and what I mean by that is it's often counterintuitive where we, uh, we've encountered very, very small utilities that insist on um, running their own networks. And we've encountered big utilities, really big utilities, that insist on not doing anything with the network and, and the requirements are that someone like us builds, operates, maintains, and, uh, and drives the network services. Uh, so it's kind of counterintuitive. Um, and so we have everything in between. And so we've built a suite of products called, uh, one's called Platform as a Service, which allows uh, a utility to bring their own gateways and use our platform to manage not only the network, but the onboarding and the uh, deployment of applications. And then we have a product called Network as a Service. So when a, uh, when a customer doesn't want to deal with the network at all, they want to focus on their mission, which is you know, whatever their utility mission is, uh, we have Network as a Service or Manage Network Services where we'll build the network on, the, on behalf of the utility and then we'll manage it on their behalf with an SLA-backed uh, uh, service level. And then we have other things that help us serve utilities. Um, in particular, uh, you may have heard over the last year or two that we've integrated with the Helium network on a global basis. And that's in, in the utility space, that is never the primary serving vehicle for things like AMI or mission critical services for obvious reasons. But it is always a uh, redundancy uh, uh, service available to our customers. And it also picks off little places that either we couldn't get to with the initial network design, or if, there's, uh, if it's in an area that, uh, 
that has dramatic growth and we have new housing uh, that weren't originally contemplated by the network design, we often pick those up until we can catch them with a carrier grade network solution. So with that as background, what do we see as the approach to, the, to attacking uh, uh, and finding and delivering solutions to big problems in the utility space? We're big believers um, in, uh, in an, uh, what we call an inverted pyramid approach. And what we mean by that is at the bottom of the pyramid, you've got to find an anchor application. The anchor application catalyzes the build out of the network. And once you've done that, you have the ability to then start moving up the inverted pyramid to add value to a variety of constituents, both in the community, well, both in the, in the utility, beyond the initial anchor application, in the community at large, and in, into businesses and the economy in that, in that community. So we believe that we're starting to settle now after years of working on this uh, on a couple anchor applications that catalyze the build out of the network, make it profitable and cash positive in a reasonable, uh, in a reasonable time period, and then allow you to move up the pyramid. So, so for water, we believe that anchor is AMI. Um, so it catalyzes the, uh, the, the, the deployment of the network. For gas, we think it's methane leak detection. And we're, we're doing a ton of work in this space with uh, a couple different partners that we'll talk about. And then for electric, we think it's what I'm calling microgrid management. Um, and, and depending on the geography, uh, spark prevention and fire prevention. And I'll talk about some specific examples of that. So I won't go through the, the, uh, the applications in the pyramid, but hopefully you get the idea that, that once we've catalyzed the network, then we can do other operational efficiency measures with the utility. Then we can, um, then we can work with the community to, um, to uh, improve safety, health, the environment. Then we can work with the government and the economic development authorities to help leverage these networks as an advantage to that community to attract businesses and help businesses become more efficient. Make sense? All right, we'll make sure everyone's with me. All right, so let's go in to the, probably what's the most inter interesting part is some, some case studies or, or profiles. So first we'll talk about water AMI. Um, I think it's been well established that, uh, that uh, AMI is a really, really strong use case for Laura Wan. We've, uh, we've been doing a lot of work in this space. Uh, we've built a, a ton of networks. We've do, done over 100 network designs. And this is one of our examples where we've deployed uh, a, um, a utility that I would call kind of a mid-size water utility. Um, it, uh, it has, they serve about 30,000 homes. Um, we built the network in 90 days with a combination of commercial towers and municipal assets like water towers or fire state, tops of fire stations, a variety of those things. Um, and within six months, we had 14,000 meters connected to the network. And today, I believe we have almost 27,000 uh, active connected meters and growing every day. So when you talk to the utility, we actually did a really uh, detailed case study on this. Uh, they came up with some interesting advantages. In addition to the quote that you see here from the, the director of finance, um, they were able to eliminate their third party metering contract, uh, significant cost savings. They were also able to uh, reduce their water loss from 12% to 3.5%. They also had the ability to uh, provide customers proactive, proactively with uh, leak alerts and with also uh, another kind of uh, perspective on leak alerts, which is high water usage alerts. Um, so those are kind of the, the financial and conservation metrics, but they also had some non-numerical metrics. So their employees reported better morale because they had more information at their fingertips to serve customers when they called in. Um, which is kind of cool. Um, also, the employees had a better safety experience, especially during COVID, uh, because they didn't have to go out into the community and read meters uh, um, you know, with face-to-face uh, uh, -face, uh, methodology. Um, and then lastly, what I'll say is uh, they are starting now to go up the pyramid, which is really exciting. So that's an example of uh, a, water ex a water utility example. 
Um, so next is gas utilities. So we've been doing, we're about three, three and a half years into this work with uh, water utilities in particular in the United States, or sorry, gas utilities um, in, in particular in the United States. Uh, we have finally gotten to the point where we have four pilots, four major pilots going across the United States, two in the West Coast, one in the East Coast, and one in the Southeast. Um, and really what we're doing here is we're working on methane leak detection, which is a huge problem. There are about, there are almost 300 gas explosions a year in the United States, um, most of which result in significant property damage and some of which repo, uh, result in, in deaths. Um, there are about 4,200 structure fires that start with the ignition of a, uh, a gas leak in, in the United States annually. Um, serious gas leak happens in the United States every 40 hours, and there's a massive Im impact from uh, gas leaks on the environment. And I could give you a statistic, it's kind of meaningless to me, but uh, over 26.6 billion cubic feet of gas has leaked from 2010 to 2021. I can't even, I, I know that's a lot, I can't even kind of put my head around that. So and if you think about that, that cap in the sky, you know, the uh, global warming and all that stuff. Um, and and so, so what's happening now, based on all these statistics, is all these gas utilities are regulated, right? So they're, the regulators are now starting to uh, mandate uh, safety measures for utilities. And they're allowing them to do rate cases and say, okay, if you have a solution, we're willing to do a rate increase so that you can pay for the, the capital and the, uh, and, the, and the operating expense to deploy these things. It's pretty exciting. And if you saw John Russ, uh, one of our partners, uh, presentation yesterday about New York, it's starting already. So Illinois, New York, I think he had a couple other states, and it's starting to just wave across. Uh, actually, our pilots in California uh, one of them is with the actual regula regulators. So they're actually participating with us in the pilot. So what have we done here? What the picture you see is, uh, is with one of our partners called the Gas, U uh, Gas Technology Institute in, Ch in Chicago. So it is the R&D arm for all the utilities around, around the world, and they're funded by the major utilities. And so we've worked with Semtech. Um, you see all the brands here. We've worked with Semtech, Lorax, uh, Genova Detect and uh, the GTI to construct a new protocol that's called device-to-device -device communications. Um, so what this allows us to do is it allows a leak detector to, to detect a leak and automatically communicate with the shutoff valve at the meter uh, until, the, until the, um, the utility can get out and, uh, and fix the problem. What's really unique about this, especially distinct from other communication technologies, is that if, if there's a massive WAN outage, so the, you have a hurricane and the cellular network's knocked out and the wireline network's knocked out, these devices will automatically form what I call a local area network and the same functionality is available. Hugely, hugely beneficial. Um, so we are actually, uh, again, I said we have four pilots going with methane leak detection uh, with major utilities. Uh, and we are just delivering a massive quote to a utility for a full rollout across their entire uh, base of 500,000 homes. So this is starting to get real traction and it's gonna deliver real safety, environmental, and, and societal benefits. So another, another version of this is um, one of our utility partners came to us and said, you know, we have this enterprise group and we're always looking for ways to help our enterprise customers be more efficient, save the environment, make their employees more healthy. Um, and so um, we, we have uh, a pilot going in, in Los Angeles right now with 50 quick service restaurants. And I don't know if you guys know this, but I, I didn't know it. A quick serve restaurant is the highest user of energy per square foot of any, uh, any uh, real estate space in America today highest user of any uh, real estate space per square foot. Um, and so anything you can do to, um, to reduce that footprint is great for the environment, but if you're a quick serve restaurant owner, you're working on, by definition, small margins. And so anything you can do to save money. Uh, and then if, uh, it turns out that appliances leak or can leak even when they're turned off. And, and a gas leak on an appliance is the equivalent of uh, you know, a good chunk of secondhand smoke. 
uh, which has its obvious uh, detriments. So, so we have 50 quick serv service restaurants and we're doing a side-by-side uh, -side pilot with 50 other restaurants that are using cellular technology. And so in each restaurant is a Lorwan gateway, um, three leak detectors, and two submeters, as you can see, uh, that go on the line that feeds the major appliance in that quick service restaurant. So in the case of a pizza uh, shop, it would be the, the oven. In the case of a, you know, something that has a griddle, it would be the grill. Um, the returns are really, really, really exciting and really positive in terms of the response from the customer um, and the response from the gas company in particular. They hate the cellular product. Big devices versus our small devices, short battery life, really hard to install because you got SIMs and all that stuff, really hard to manage over time. And so this is really exciting. In this market alone, um, the utility tells us there are 40,000 locations for this service, and they're going to be the driver of it. So really exciting. So next example is uh, electric utilities. The, um, the, uh, uh, there's a couple opportunities here. One is in what I call microgrid management. So there are about 180 million uh, utility poles in the United States. Most of those are 50 to 60 years old, well beyond their, their useful life. And so when one of those poles goes down, you know, it's, uh, it's power out. And so what we've done is we've, we've uh, worked with a company called Unibiz, who has a device, which is really cool. Uh, essentially, it's a thing that hooks on a power line and goes between two poles and measures the, uh, the magnetic field going across the line. It's really easy to put up. You put it on a pole, you stand on the ground, and you hook it. Um, so what happens when the power goes out is it sends a, an alarm message, but it also lights a light, a really bright light at the bottom. That, when combined with a pole tilt monitor that wraps around the pole, gives you really, really good visibility. The power's out, and by the way, I think I know why the pole's tilted over. Very simple. Um, these these uh, poles often happen to be in very remote areas, and so so uh, there's a great opportunity for not only terrestrial capability, but also for satellite capability. It's a perfect application for lower WAM-based satellite because you just need a monthly keep alive ping uh, until there's a problem and then you ping like crazy. So it's also a great opportunity for combined gas and electric. So you can do the, you can build this big network for methane leak detection and then say, hey, by the way, your electric utility can use the same network to do microgrid management. So the last example is, uh, and I'll, I think this one's an obvious example. In particular, in California, the electric companies are, had a big problem with sparks being uh, generated from uh, transformers in, with old technology and creates a big fire. And there's huge liability. And so we partnered with a, a, a company that has a uh, surge slash uh, spark arrester. Uh, we've got a pilot going in, uh, in Northern California, and the benefits, I don't think, just based on time I have, I don't think I need to go through the benefits, tremendous. This is another one that is good for both a terrestrial and a satellite uh, capability, and we've, uh, we've announced that we've integrated with uh, UTELSAT uh, in France for a lower wan based uh, satellite uh, service also. So we have all those, again, extreme flexibility is required to serve these applications. So with, uh, you know, I guess what, this is the hard knocks slide. Um, and the hard knocks in our case is about three or four years of learning. Um, the first thing you gotta figure out when you're, when you're uh, tackling the utility space is who do they trust? These are huge, old, uh, behemoth companies, and even the small ones, um, only do business with people they trust. So you gotta find the people they trust, uh, the relationships, and work with them and through them. Um, these are very uh, long procurement cycles, so be prepared for RFPs, and sometimes multiple RFPs, sometimes multiple RFIs and RFPs, sometimes reissues, those kinds of things. Uh, you gotta have carry grade functionality, so four or five nines, but usually five nines. You gotta have a great security story. And you've got to be able to, as you saw in most of my charts, there are multiple logos on those charts. So you've got to have a company culture that allows you to partner, right? Because no one of us can solve these huge societal and business problems by ourselves. You've got to have a culture that allows you to collaborate, innovate, and innovate with not only the customer in the room, but uh, with multiple suppliers. Um, and then uh, lastly, you've got to think about scale and duration 
The, um, our, uh, in the water space, our average contract is 13 years, our shortest is 10 years, our longest is 20 years. So you gotta be in this for the long haul. So in summary, um, the, the, the utility space, I think, is the place where LoRaWAN is gonna scale. It's, it's what I think and I believe. You know, there's a lot of different opportunities for LoRaWAN and you, know, you can get 10,000 here, 100,000 here, 5,000 here. We need millions, right? We need millions. So we gotta solve these big business and societal problems for utilities, catalyzing the deployment of these networks, very dense, and really proving the value proposition and then start, start layering everything else on. So, so um, it's a great scale opportunity. We think the inverted uh, pyramid is the way to tackle this. And um, you know, you've gotta be really flexible. And the, um, one of the things that we're all trying to do is, is, is use our technology to, for a greater purpose, I think. You know, to help society, help businesses, make it, make it safer and help the environment. And I think the utility space is a, is a way to really catalyze uh, that vision and that higher purpose. Um, I'll just leave you with the final thought, which is it's hard. I mean, we're three and a half years into the gas space. Uh, Jim, how long are we into water? Jim, Jim O? Um, five years, five years, and we're really scaling that now. Um, so, um, so it takes a while. You gotta be patient. Uh, it's a hard one to crack, but when you do, the benefits are massive and the scale is massive. So with that, uh, thank you for your attention right before lunch, and uh, I'll leave you to go to lunch. Thank you, Bruce. I just may, may I, I comment on two points which I want, want to make here. You showed out a very specific thing with this kitchen and gas thing. Just imagine, because we had several sessions during uh, yesterday and all the two that will come some up. Imagine you have the kitchen, you have Laura Wan in a gastronomy. We saw the use case before presented about the restrooms. Each restaurant has a restroom. You have the gas security thing in the kitchen. We learned about the uh, food control, fridging temperatures. So this is a very small little yeah, universe of having at least 20, 40, 50 different use cases in a small restaurant. What I'm up to is going for small, medium businesses. When we're talking LoRaWAN, yes, and you're absolutely right, Bruce, we'll need to focus on big rollouts and tell the world that this LoRaWAN is a, a secure, scalable environment, and we have big, big rollouts in the market already. But the main change I see is when we get the people recognizing that LoRaWAN is so easy to use as an end user, like we're doing all with Wi-Fi, Anybody can explain what are you doing with Wi-Fi. Only a few people really can explain how it is working technically, but this is not the important thing, right? So I really love that to see how more and more use cases independently of the city, if this is utility, if this is industry, merging each to each other. And for me, LoRaWAN is one of the greatest technology by bringing all these different requirements together into one network.